work on something for years and hope somebody will have an idea. That you don't have to be famous, you just have to have an idea, right? So, uh, uh, but I'm going to start uh, by trying to motivate it. And um, uh, so, w there are many ways to motivate random matrix theory. Um, and one way that, that works for me is um, uh, what I call probabilizing things. So it's, I made up this word. <laughs> Prob and there, when you meet a new mathematical object, uh, one way to start to touch it or get some idea of what it's about. Of course, there are many routes to that, but a way that I often find useful is to ask um, what a typical one looks like. And um, uh, of course, that's not a well-defined <laughs> idea, but uh, uh, it, it, you will know what I mean if you don't already. And let me just give an example uh, uh, and I'm going to give a talk tomorrow with, with more examples, uh, but suppose you, you want to think about permutations. So, for example, let X be Sn, all permutations. And uh, uh, the question, the kind of question becomes uh, uh, pick um, sigma in Sn at random, um, and what does it look like? Now, look like isn't well defined, uh, so let's give some examples. Uh, you might ask uh, how many fixed points, um, uh, uh, how many fixed points, Oop. many uh, fixed points, um, and I'm not I'm not used to this, and if it stops working, I'll have to yell. But uh, that, that's one of the earliest questions that was studied, Momore 1708. Uh, um, you know, and a typical permutation has about one fixed point, but more, more carefully, uh, 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 I see what's happening. <laughs> um, uh, uh, if f of uh, uh, sigma is the number of fixed points, uh, uh, the f of sigma uh, goes as Poisson uh, 1, uh, which, which is shorthand for um, uh, the, the probability, the proportion of permutations such that f of sigma um, is equal to j um, is asymptotic to 1 over uh, e times j factorial uh, 0 less than or equal to j less than or equal to infinity, of course. So now, this is one of these things. If I can help somebody, there are people with many different languages in this room, especially at the beginning. If I can help somebody, you can ask about notation or what does that mean, okay? But this is, uh, this is a, a, a classical theorem. And this is the Poisson distribution on the integers, and it has mean one and variance one. And typical permutation has about one um, fixed point. Um, you can ask uh, about the number of cycles, uh, and uh, 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 the, the, a, classical, a classical theorem uh, is that the probability that the number of cycles in sigma, uh, it's around log n, uh, minus log n, over the square root of log n, um, is less than or equal to x, uh, uh, is approximately equal to uh, the integral from minus infinity to x e to the minus t squared over 2, square root of 2 pi, which I'll write capital Phi of x. Um, uh, so, Pick a permutation at random. How many cycles does it have? It's around log n. The fluctuations uh, are order root n, and the, 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 the shape of the fluctuations is the bell-shaped uh, the bell-shaped curve. Uh, uh, um, the 
uh, uh, another question, what's the longest cycle? Pick a permutation at random, how long is the longest cycle? Uh, L of sigma, the longest cycle, I won't say it in detail, but uh, we know it in great detail, uh, is approximately 0.61 n. Uh, we, I, this is some constant, which is, I, I could say, but, uh, uh, and we know the, 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 the fluctuation, so a typical permutation has one pretty long cycle. And uh, another type of question is what's the order? Um, uh, the order is the, the order of sigma is the, the smallest k such that sigma to the k is the identity. Uh, and the theorem says that uh, the probability that the log of the order of sigma uh, minus uh, log n squared over 2 divided by the square root of uh, log n cubed over 3 uh, less than or equal to x uh, is approximately equal, is asymptotic to capital Phi of x. And so uh, a typical, well, if you, if you bravely exponentiate, uh, a typical permutation has, uh, has order e to the log n squared over 2. Uh, but this is an actual theorem. So that's what I mean. Uh, that is, you know, pick some features, and then I promise you that if you try to study these, um, you'll learn something about the permutation group. Um, now, uh, my motivation for studying random matrix theory was, um, was to make analogs of these kinds of theorems for, um, for other groups. And uh, without, there, there is a, there's a story, but I won't have time to tell it. Um, uh, but I wanted to study similar problems for, uh, say, the classical compact groups. Uh, so let me, let me, I'm going to specialize and then tell you how it generalizes. Uh, let un uh, be equal to the set of all m, uh, uh, n by n matrices with complex entries uh, such that m, m star um, is the identity, the, the unitary group, um, and uh, which is some classical, <laughs> classical thing that's in, in every, in every work, walk of mathematical life. And the question becomes, pick a matrix at random uh, from the uniform distribution on the unitary group. What does it look like? Um, now, all of the questions I told you about here only depend on the uh, permutation up to conjugacy, uh, so they, they are, I, these questions, uh, you can ask questions that do depend on coordinates, but these questions, uh, you're allowed to change coordinates and irrelevant labeling doesn't come into any of these features. And uh, the conjugacy classes of the unitary group, the analog for the unitary group, uh, are, um, are, you know, the, the conjugacy class of a matrix is determined by the eigenvalues of a unitary matrix. And so um, uh, M uh, is, has, has eigenvalues, uh, uh, E to the I theta J, J equals 1 up to N. Unitary matrices don't change length, and so their eigenvalues are on the unit circle. And um, uh, so a question becomes, pick a matrix at random, what do its eigenvalues look like? And it's just an exact analog of these kinds of, of, of questions, a very natural little step to make. Um, uh, let's talk about, for a second, pick a matrix at random. Uh, random is equal to Haar measure. Uh, so any, any group, any locally compact group has, a, has a, an invariant measure on it, like length on the circle. And um, uh, so Haar measure is a probability measure on the unitary group uh, such that the probability uh, under Haar measure that M is contained in some set of ma matrices uh, A uh, is invariant under translation uh, is equal to the probability that M is contained in, say, gamma times A, where here, uh, uh, a is a subset of uh, un, and gamma is uh, an element of un. So just just the the, uni the uniform distribution on the circle on the circle on uh, on the un on the unitary group, um, and 
I find it helps m most people to have the following description of Haar measure, because the construction of Haar measure, well, you'll hear more about that when Peter Forrester talks, but um, you know, it's, it's often done as a, it's an abstract theorem, and uh, Haar measure is actually a pretty tangible thing. Uh, how do I actually pick such a matrix? Well, there are, there are many schemes, but one way um, is the following. Take an empty matrix um, and fill it up with elements uh, z, i, j, um, which are uh, x plus i, y, uh, and x and y are independent uh, normal um, zero. I, I standardize them to a half, but this is, uh, th these are independent standard complex normals, um, so just fill up an empty matrix with, uh, with uh, independent normals, and then make it unitary um, uh, by doing the Gram-Schmidt algorithm. Uh, make the first row have norm one, take the first row out of the second row, make what's left have norm one, and keep going. Uh, so this, this goes to M, and that's our measure. So uh, you only could uh, write two lines of code, and one quick way to write them is generate the matrix, and then do the QR algorithm that uh, the Q part of the QR algorithm uh, is, is this M, and uh, so that's very quick to do. And then if, I, if you like MATLAB or something else, you could just ask for the eigenvalues, and so it's very easy to, to generate uh, a random matrix from, from, from Haar measure and, and look at the eigenvalues. Um, and um, so that, that's the... Uh, that's the setup, and, and that's one motivation. And a motivation, there are, there are motivations for studying these questions from physics and, um, and, and computer science and, and quantum computation and lots of other motivations. But another motivation is the math is pretty nice. And uh, so I'll, I'll stick with that motivation for this lecture. Um, and um, so... I want to try to get my hands on the eigenvalues of, of, uh, of a random matrix, a, a random unitary matrix. And one, this, a standard way of doing that is to look at the, the, the trace and, or traces. And um, so consider, um, consider uh, trace of M. Uh, uh, which is just the sum of the eigenvalues. Uh, that's, that's one feature. And then we'll consider the sum of squares and the sum of cubes. And as I'll show you, if you know all about the, the, the traces, then you know all about the eigenvalues in, in reasonable sense. Um, so this, was, uh, this is now a well-posed math problem. Pick a matrix at random, look at its trace. And if you think about it, if you have any projection into probability at all, well, it's a big matrix. The trace is the sum of a lot of little things. It, it, it must be, it is, that the trace is normal. Uh, that's, uh, that the trace follows the, 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 the bell-shaped curve. And uh, Shashahani and I proved that um, a long time ago. Uh, um, we... We, we proved that uh, the probability that the trace of M uh, is contained in A uh, minus um, uh, the, the, let's write it down, the integral of um, over A of E to the minus uh, 1 over 2z squared uh, dz, uh, two-dimensional integral over pi, uh, 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 this goes to zero, and, and so that that that's now one thing to notice about this. Um, so the eigenvalues are uh, n roots of unity on the unit circle. Um, if you put n points down at random on the unit circle, and then add them up, uh, you'd have to divide by square root of n in order to get it to behave itself. Um, here, there's no norming. The trace is is uh, Gaussian without any adjustment, uh, and, um, uh, and of course, if you had n points exactly one over n apart, 
the n roots of unity, they sum to zero. So the, the eigenvalues are much closer to perfectly uniformly distributed, one over n apart, than they are to, to, to random points. They do have some randomness in them, and I'm sorry I don't have little pictures to show you, but uh, they're in a lot of places. Um, and now, here's a, here's a first surprise. Um, uh, so the argument, the heuristic argument, and it was certainly the way I thought, um, that, that, gave, um, that gave this convergence is, well, a trace is the sum of a lot of little things and a lot of little things that are not too big and not too dependent. They tend to be normally distributed. Um, and uh, Kurt Johansson uh, got a rate of convergence in this theorem. So let me take the soup over Borel sets A uh, in UN. So this is the total variation distance between these two measures. This is less than or equal to constant over n factorial. Now, in probability, we live with error terms that are of size 1 over square root of n, right? 1 over n factorial. I mean, you know, n is 52. You know, they're, they're the same measures. You know, so, so that story I gave about, well, it's the sum of a lot of little things, and they're kind of not too dependent, that's all baloney. <laughs> uh, you know, this is a theorem. Uh, um, um, uh, so that's one, you know, just you start hacking away and, 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 and this kind of, 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 of math comes out. Um, in order to understand the eigenvalues, you need to also know about um, the, the, the the trace of the square and the trace of the cube, and um, I'll, I'll write it down here. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the trace of m squared, um, which is the sum of e to the i two theta j, uh, goes as a, a two-dimensional Gaussian uh, with mean zero and um, a complex Gaussian and, and variance two. And similarly, um, uh, we showed that the, the trace of m to the k goes as normal uh, with uh, 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 mean uh, with variance k. Uh, uh, so uh, just so the, the the higher traces are more spread out, uh, and uh, we also showed that the that the the trace, the trace of the square, the trace of the cube, et cetera, are um, all uh, independent asymptotically in a pretty strong sense. I'll state that in a, in a, in a second. Um, and uh, so, so we kind of know about the, about the joint distribution of the traces, and that, um, that, that helps. Uh, um, uh, let me write that down as a theorem. Uh, 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 um, so uh, M chosen uniformly in UN, uh, then um, the expected value of the product of the trace of uh, M to the J to the AJ uh, times the trace of uh, M to the uh, J, you need complex conjugates to the BJ, um, uh, Okay, so the, these are the joint mixed moments of the traces. Um, uh, is equal to <laughs> is equal to uh, the product uh, of um, the expected value of uh, the square root of j z j to the a j um, the square root of j z j bar to the b j uh, j equals 1 to k, um, uh, so long as uh, n is a little bit large, is bigger than uh, the max of two things, uh, the sum of uh, uh, k a k, uh, the sum of k b k. So, so take some moments, you know, 
fix, fix how far you want to go, fix what products you want to work with, and then if n is bigger, you know, but that's now fixed as, as long as n is sufficiently large, all the joint mixed moments equal the joint mixed moments of the uh, of standard Gauss uh, m measure um, uh, you know, for, all, for all n. So not, not approximately, not asymptotically equal. Um, and uh, that allows you to, to get your hands on the distribution of various functionals. Uh, let me finish this little introductory review with uh, one more amazing fact due to Eric Raines, uh, but <laughs> um, uh, if n is bigger than, if, if k <laughs> is bigger than or equal to n, um, the uh, eigenvalues of um, uh, m to the k, so uh, are exactly, again, uh, distributed as uh, n uniform independent points. That is, uh, you know, if, if the eigenvalues are getting more and more spread out, when k is any fixed k, you know, and this is not an asymptotic theorem. You know, n could be three. Uh, if you take the fourth power of a random three by three matrix, the three eigenvalues are like three independent points on the unit circle. So a first question that I, I really don't understand, um, you know, this first part says that the eigenvalues are very, very neatly distributed. And Eric says um, that, uh, you know, the, the high powers of them are completely random. How can the world be that it's like that? That is, is there some conceptual picture of how the eigenvalues go? I, I, mean, I just have no idea about that. You know, in principle, you could do the following. Put n, n points at random on the unit circle, and then uh, I'm trying to help the photographer by <laughs> standing back, she asked me to. Put n points at random on the circle, and then take case roots of them. There's some way to get our measure from that. I mean, you know, tr try it when k is, you know, when n is 3. I mean, you know, how can I, you know, how, how, you know, what's going on? What's some intellectual picture, mathematical picture that makes that compatible with the, with the rest of these things? And I just, I just don't, don't uh, know um, uh, the answer to that question. And uh, I'd love it if somebody would <laughs> cook up an answer to that question. Um, let me finish. Uh, m by saying two things. Um, so I'll explain the picture on the handout. Um, so this math lets you, uh, lets you prove theorems about somewhat general f features of a, of a matrix. Um, uh, so uh, application, uh, if... Uh, f is a function from the unit circle into, say, c, uh, and um, uh, if uh, lambda m of f is the sum of f of e to the i theta j, uh, j equals 1 to n, so this is an additive function of the eigenvalues, um, uh, well, uh, you can just Fourier expand uh, f uh, f is the sum of f hat at k, uh, z to the k, k equals minus infinity to infinity, uh, and then um, uh, rigor aside for a second, I'll say what a, a, ki a kind of typical sort of set of assumptions that are needed, but um, then uh, lambda n of uh, f uh, is equal to the sum of f hat of k times the trace of uh, m to the k. I mean, so sorry about this equals. It, you do have to be a little careful uh, uh, about, about, about when you can do this, but it's, uh, th that is, 
this is like the kth powers of the eigenvalues, and that's just like the, the trace. Um, and, uh, and since these are independent normal, this converges to uh, a limiting random variable, which is, which is Gaussian. Uh, and that's, that's true for very, very general uh, Fs. Uh, in particular, for example, if F is contained, just to say something with math in it, if F is uh, these half uh, differentiable functions, um, uh, this is the set of all uh, functions. Uh, uh, so this is F is in L2 and summation absolute value of j, um, uh, 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 f hat of j absolute value squared is finite, the, this, this, this space uh, h1 half, uh, if then, then, then this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this goes, now this is as n goes to infinity, this is well defined, uh, this converges almost surely, and, uh, and uh, this goes uh, to, the sum of um, f hat at k uh, uh, z um, z k, where the z k's are independent uh, 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 times times k <laughs> times uh, square root of k. Right. Um, uh, so the z k's are independent Gaussians, and uh, these are the Fourier coefficients. And so you know for and if if f isn't so, you know, if f is the indicator function of an interval, you can subtract off a mean and, and fiddle a little bit. But this independence of the traces um, allows you to study quite, this is a linear function, you can study quadratic and higher order functions of the eigenvalues. And on the handout, I gave, um, I gave an example, um, which was, um, I took the, uh, the, the logarithmic derivative of the characteristic polynomial. Um, so, um, for example, uh, if uh, P sub M of Z is equal to the determinant of uh, the identity minus, uh, no, M minus the identity, M minus Z times the identity, um, if that's the, the, the characteristic polynomial, of, of, the, of the matrix, uh, you can look at uh, P prime over P, uh, and that is um, the, the derivative of the logarithm, so that's uh, uh, one over uh, one minus Z e to the minus I theta, maybe something like that, uh, and you can expand that, uh, this is, the sum of uh, uh, z to the j, uh, uh, the trace of m to the j, and um, uh, that, it, as long as z is uh, in the unit circle, um, that sum exists and is just fine, and this, uh, is, this converges to, as n goes to infinity, um, uh, the sum of z to the j times the square root of j times z, zj, where zj's are independent normals. And so, so this, this is one example uh, of, of how you can use these theorems in order to study some feature. And I'm sorry the pictures didn't come out probably so well, but if you look uh, at the paper patterns and eigenvalues, you can see them on your computer in living color. Uh, and uh, that's a picture, uh, one is of a random 100 by 100 matrix, and those tree-like, those tree-like leaves, well, these kinds of Gaussian fields, this is a field, this is a Gaussian variable, but it depends on z, so you can, that, the picture is a plot of this as z ranges over the unit uh, disk, the intern, inside of the unit disk, and those tree-like fringes are, um, are the zeros of, of, of this function, and, and there's a, there's a picture for a matrix, and there's a picture for, for a, the Gaussian approximation, and they, they look very similar, and they're provably very similar. This convergence is uniformly uncompact. So, so that is meant as a review. I hope it's not too fast. I hope it's not too slow, but probably it's both for some people. Um, the, as a summary, um, uh, the, the, if you pick a random matrix from Haar measure on the unitary group, the traces are independent Gaussian, and that's useful. 
Okay, that's, that's the takeaway message from this part of the talk. Um, there's a second part of the takeaway message is exactly, essentially exactly the same theorems are true for the orthogonal group and the symplectic group. They're also true for the finite reflection groups associated with those groups. For example, um, uh, for the symmetric group and the, um, the hyperoctahedral group and E8, <laughs> in addition. Uh, so, so these kinds of theorems are, are available. Um, let me just parse that for one second. Um, so suppose I take what's the analog of, of, of these theorems for the symmetric group. Well, pick a permutation at random, look at its permutation matrix, take the trace of that, that's just the number of fixed points. We said it, the first thing I said was that's Poisson 1. Well, the first n moments of the number of fixed points equal the first n moments of Poisson 1, and, uh, and, and so on. So there's very, very high order contact between um, uh, the limit theorems and the, um, and the, uh, uh, and the distribution of, uh, of the eigenvalues of these compact ensembles. Uh, and um, so that's, um, that's, that's the random matrix part of what I wanted to talk about. And uh, there are many, many people who've contributed to this. And I, I said some of the names. And uh, in the references I gave out, um, I've said others. Um, OK. So now, just let's see, put this here. Just one second. So oh, that's chalk, first of all. but. Uh, new talk starting. If you're lost, you think, God, what is this guy talking about? New talk starting, okay? So listen up for a minute, okay? See if you want to see the second part of the talk, right? Uh, new talks, completely different subject, okay? Um, uh, so this is the, the, the study of, of Toplitz operators. Um, uh, so, um, uh, um, so a Toplitz operator uh, 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 it, uh, is a, a striped matrix. So uh, four by four, A, 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 uh, B, 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 C, C, D, uh, E, 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 F, F, G. <laughs> so it's a, it's a striped matrix. <laughs> And uh, often they're going to be symmetric or Hermitian, uh, not, not always or not necessarily. And um, uh, this thing is it's, it's called a Toplitz matrix. And um, uh, it, it's hard to say in, in an hour why these are as interesting as they are. Um, I try to put some references on, and I'll try to say a sentence or two about it, but just trust me for 15 minutes. There are lots and lots of appear toplets matrix. Okay, that's a, that's a good example. Here's another example. Um, if, uh, if, uh, uh, if F from, uh, I could take the detourist, but let me just take the unit circle. If F is a, 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 an L2 function, from the um, from the circle into the unit interval, okay. I can try to define a point process. Um, uh, 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 define uh, x j j contained in z, where x j is contained in. 0, 1, so uh, a random process taking value 0, where do the trees grow, that kind of a process. Uh, I can define a point process, I can try by saying um, the uh, probability that x sub i1 equals x sub i2 equals x sub ik um, uh, equals 1. <laughs> Uh, so there are ones in those places, and maybe anything else any place. I could try to define that by saying it's the determinant of um, f of uh, e to the um, i a minus i a uh, minus i b, and maybe I better put Fourier transform. So 
this is a this this is a k by k uh, uh, determinant. I, th that is a determinant, and uh, and the first statement is well, this is positive under that that assumption. And if you now extend, if you these definitions cohere. That is, if I make this definition for any k tuple, uh, these are the chances you have ones at those positions. Then, um, if I that's enough information to define the process for all values at all positions, and it all works out. So this does define a um, this does define a stationary point process on the on the real line, and in fact in in uh, in ZD. Uh, and so you know the 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 behavior of these kinds of this is a Toeplitz matrix. Uh, the behavior of these kinds of um, of of of. of of, of determinants is, is of interest. But there, there's many, many other motivations for, for, for that. These are two from probability, but uh, they do come up all over the place. So the, um, the, I would love to explain to you how this is, what I'm about to say is equivalent to studying the eigenvalues of Toeplitz matrices, but uh, I can't, so I'll, just in order, I have, we're going to study the eigenvalues of such matrices by uh, large ones, by, um, by, um, by looking at determinants. And uh, so in order to be able to take a limit, um, uh, let's let uh, f be equal to um, uh, um, uh, uh, well, f is f from s1 into uh, into uh, say C, uh, be continuous, something. It, there's very many, many conditions be continuous, but that's one uh, where it works. And let me use the Fourier coefficients to define an infinite uh, Toeplitz matrix. And uh, so uh, Tn of, uh, we call this G, uh, Tn of G uh, is equal to uh, the matrix. Uh, which has uh, JK entry uh, uh, G hat of uh, G hat of J minus K. Uh, so, and this is N by N. So, if I want to take limits, I, I can I can have some sequence of coefficients. So, this matrix has G zero on the main diagonal, G one on the first super diagonal, G minus one on the first. Minor, minus diagonal, etc. Um, th these are the uh, these are the um, uh, uh, this is a, this gives me a sequence of of, uh, of matrices, and you can go backwards, and I'm just that is okay. This gives me a natural sequence of matrices, and um, uh, one version of the strong Sago limit theorem uh, theorem, uh, and this is Sago. Uh, the strong Sago limit theorem. Um, uh, if uh, G is a little bit nice, and I'm going to, in order to state something simply, e to the uh, F of um, uh, Z, so, okay, uh, where uh, summation F is in this class that I was working with, uh, summation of uh, absolute value of k, uh, f hat at k uh, squared um, uh, is finite. So g has nice Fourier coefficients. Okay, that's one way of, of, of thinking about this. Um, then the, the determinant, uh, then the determinant, uh, determinant of uh, Tn of g, um, okay, that's a, just a determinant of a n by n matrix, uh, is asymptotic to uh, e to the uh, n uh, g hat at 0 plus uh, the sum of, um, abs of, of, of k, uh, uh, f of k, uh, absolute value squared, uh, plus little o of 1, so equals. So, so uh, um, we and we can 
we can get our hands on, on, uh, on, the, uh, on these determinants and, and have you know, pretty, good, pretty good information about, the, um, about the, the, the behavior of determinants. And you could imagine that that would be interesting in studying these kinds of point processes. Uh, I don't have time to say it, but um, uh, Sago proved this theorem in order to allow Onsager and or Koifman to complete their proof of the, of the analysis of the two-dimensional icing model, and, uh, but this theorem has all kinds of, of applications. Now, one thing you might be sitting there noticing is, you know, this really does seem to be another talk, right? It's just it's some other talk, right? What does this have to do with anything that I was talking about in the first half? Uh, that's... So the, the claim is, and this is really the second question uh, to the audience, is uh, this theorem is completely equivalent to the theorem I proved with Shashahani about the traces being normal. So uh, that, that I, I still, so a question is, you know, I, I can prove it, I did prove it, but I mean, to try to understand it, that's the actual second question. Why is that true? And, and so, um, so the, what I wanna, um, and just so that I don't kill anybody in particular time, um, okay, uh, somebody, Ivan will stop me if I get too enthusiastic, uh, but uh, so I want to explain, uh, so fact, uh, strong sago, uh, uh, is c completely equivalent to um, uh, the theorem about the trace of m to the uh, k goes as normal uh, zero k. Um, so that that that's uh, and uh, it might be worth telling the story of how that was discovered. Um, I had proved this theorem about the traces, and I gave a talk in Stockholm, and afterward, Kurt Johansson sort of upset, actually, not badly upset, but sort of upset. Well, he said, well, how did you prove that theorem? Now, I gave a proof in my talk, but it wasn't Kurt's kind of math, so obviously wasn't a very clear description of, of the proof for my part, but uh, I think at that point, Kurt didn't know probability, he certainly does now, uh, but he said, how did you prove that theorem? And he said, did you use Sago's theorem? And I said, what's Sago's theorem? Because I'd never heard of Sago's theorem. And the way I proved it is by moments, uh, the way, I, the way I, I didn't explain the proof, but that was the way I proved it. Um, and, and so Kurt explained to me how my theorem impl you know, was implied by the strong Sago theorem, but not wanting to be scooped, I said, yes, but the argument is reversible. <laughs> so that my theorem implies the strong Sago theorem, and that's true also. Uh, and so let me, let me, um, let me explain that, um, and then ask for your help. That's, that's the real reason I'm giving this talk is, but okay, but first let me at least get to what, what the connection is. So uh, I do have this thing which will be on my grave, you know, that you know, did magic tricks. So here comes one, but it's not due to me. Uh, it's due to Heine and Sago. Uh, so there's a magic trick. <laughs> Um, so if, um, if g is, is such a function, uh, g as above, then um, the, the integral um, uh, over s1 uh, to the um, n of um, 1 over 2 pi to the n times the product of of uh, g of um, uh, theta j, uh, j equals 1 to n uh, times the uh, product uh, of a1 less than or equal to a less than b uh, less than or equal to n of e to the i theta a minus e to the i theta b absolute value squared d theta. Um, so this is the average of, of this product, 
um, uh, with respect to, this is the density of Haar measure on the unitary group, but it's just a, a van der Monde. This is equal to uh, Tn of G. So, you know, just period. It's equal to Tn of G. So, given that it's true, uh, I, we called it the Heine-Sago theorem. Uh, Heine did something similar, but Sago is the one who wrote down this formula. Anyway, well, given that it's true, how bad can it be? It's not so bad. This thing on the right-hand side is a Toeplitz determinant, so it's a determinant. So expand it out as a sum of permutations, and it's a product of of, you know, of the entries of the determinant. Now, each of the entries is, it, is itself uh, a Fourier transform. Uh, that's, the way, that's the way the entries of the matrix are defined. So write it as a Fourier transform, write it as an integral uh, uh, over G, so you get, a, you get an n-fold integral, and then you know, change orders and recognize a, a, a van der Monde, and it's just not hard to go from the definition here to the definition here. You really you really all could do it in half an hour, or if not, you can ask me. And if I can't do it in half an hour, I owe you a cup of coffee. Uh, um, but so that's an identity, right? So let, let us take that as having been demonstrated. And, um, and so now, Uh, so I'm going to, so let me suppose the theorem of the, that the, we know that the traces are Gaussian. Uh, say, we know uh, the trace of m to the k uh, is Gaussian, uh, goes as normal in two dimensions, 0k. And, you know, this is for 1 up to capital K. Uh, as n goes to infinity, the limiting distribution of these traces are, are Gaussian. Um, and let me take uh, my function f uh, to be, and let me, this is one place where I wrote it down in the hope that I, well, I'll just make it up. <laughs> uh, uh, but um, uh, so let me take my function f there uh, to be a trigonometric polynomial. f of z is the sum of a j uh, cosine uh, j theta, uh, z is e to the i theta, uh, plus b j sine uh, j theta. So it's a trig trigonometric polynomial, j equals, say, you know, 1 up to capital K, something like that. Um, and uh, the, the Fourier transform of, of Gauss measure, uh, uh, just uh, the expected value of e to the, um, uh, well, let's write it down, square root of j x plus, uh, uh, i, y, see if I can, do this. Uh, the, the Fourier transform of a standard Gaussian variable uh, is e to the j over 4. Uh, 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 I have to put in some a's and b's. <laughs> a, b's. Let me make this a and b uh, is a squared plus b squared. Um, uh, this is j over 4. Anyway, the Fourier transform of Gauss measure is, uh, are these, uh, are these uh, quadratics. And um, um, if, I, uh, if I look at uh, the a's and the b's as Fourier transform variables, uh, so the, um, uh, the expected value of e to the sum of a, j, uh, the real part of the trace of uh, m to the j uh, plus b, j, the imaginary part of the trace of m to the j, um, just these are random variables, this successive traces, j equals 1 up to k, um, this, um, the, this be, because these things are converging to Gaussian, this converges to uh, e to the sum of a j squared uh, times, uh, times j uh, plus b j squared times j, 
j equals 1 up to n, um, which is f, <laughs> right? And now, you know, th 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 this is, this is, this is equal to, this is equal to, uh, this is, I'm not saying this very well, but this is equal to, what is this equal to? Uh, hmm. Now I've gotten myself slightly confused. Um, let's see. So if the normal theorem is true, this, um, these these coefficients are these are these cosines, and uh, but you know th th these are independent normal with mean zero and variance uh, and variance j uh, e each, and uh, so this is converging to this, and um, and where's my f? Uh, f is hmm. Sorry, now I'm. I'm a, I'm a little I'm a little scattered, but uh, it it it's 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 half a line away, uh, and rather than look, uh, I, well, I, I'll just I'll just say uh, um, uh, that is so. Where am I? Um, sorry about this. Um, it's not the right time to have a technical disorder, um, but um, uh, so if I know the theorem about the traces, then for trigonometric polynomials, um, I want to say I have Sago's theorem. And so how do I have Sago's theorem? Um, uh, this is the thing I just computed, right? This is the expected value of, of of, 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 of this. This is Haar measure, and, and these, this expected value is with respect to Haar measure. So I, I just computed this because this is equal to the toplets determinant, and this is what Sago says the, the limiting toplets determinant is. So sorry for a little bit of a mess, but um, so using this identity, if I know the normality, I have that this, uh, the, the asymptotics of this toplets determinant are equal to the asymptotics of the left-hand side, which is what Sago's theorem says. And then all of the steps are, are, are reversible. So um, up to my making a mess, uh, that, that's the argument. And so it, everything is absolute straightforward except for this, this magic trick. So uh, is there some more conceptual reason that connects Toplitz determinants and Toplitz operators to um, to uh, to the unitary group, and my best guess is it has something to do with bosonic fermionic correspondence, but I can't make math out of that, so I'm not going to try to say it. Um, a few more sentences, uh, and Ivan, when should I have stopped, or when, how much more time is it? Three minutes. Okay, so a, a few more sentences. Um, uh, uh, the because, because I know similar theorems about traces for, um, for uh, other ensembles, like the orthogonal and, and symplectic and, and other ensembles too, um, you get versions of Sago-like theorems in those um, settings. Um, uh, if you wanted something to think about other than my question, um, there are many other um, uh, generalizations of Sago's theorem, uh, and our many people in this audience, friend Victor Gilliman, has been telling me, for, and Rafe's advisor, Richard Melrose, has been telling me for years, well, you know, Sago, uh, Toplitz operators, that's the same as pseudo-differential operators. And I said, what? But, okay, but I now understand at least what they mean. There's some sense in which they really are, there really is an equivalence, at least for big classes. And so, uh, I put some references to, to Victor's work on. Uh, Victor, when he proved theorems of Sago-like type in the setting of this pseudo-differential operator setting, didn't bother, I'll say, to prove strong theorems. He proved weak Sago-type theorems. And so there's some work to do if you wanted to do that. But there's also some work to do to try to say, is there some random object like the unitary group which would, um, which would, uh, which would 
you know, fit in, fit in with this picture. On the references, um, uh, uh, let me uh, just t take you through a sentence or two about the references. Um, uh, this talk, with the proper details, uh, soon to be a major motion picture, uh, is, uh, is my paper, Patterns and Eigenvalues, the Gibbs lecture I gave a few years ago. Um, the stuff, uh, a, a careful version, and many, many generalizations of the, um, of the uh, symmetric function of, of, the, um, of the toplets uh, unitary connection. The thing I was trying to sketch out here is in a paper I wrote with Dan Bump, and there we extended Sago's theorem to, um, to get asymptotics of toplets minors, and that was important in, um, in, this, um, in this area. And Russ Lyons wrote a beautiful paper with Jeff Steiff using these, the asymptotics of these toplets minors in order to do probability theory of determinal uh, point processes. Um, and um, I've only touched the, the utility of Sago's theorem, and they're just two beautiful papers, one by um, uh, Percy Dyfe, the other Percy D, uh, which I uh, gave a reference to, which you know, fills out in loving detail the, the application of Sago's theorem to the icing model and gives nine different proofs of the, uh, of the strong Sago theorem. And then uh, completely orthogonal to that is uh, Nick Bingham's survey of the use of Sago theorems in probability. So there, there, there is high order contact between random matrix theory and, and toplets operators, but it's still a wide open area. I hope I gave you a peek at it. Thank Thank you. Thank you. So do we have some questions for Percy? Sure. sure if I this uh, asymptotic uh, independence of uh, the traces, is that true also for I don't, I don't know, but if you think about it, it it's quite intuitive probabilistically. If I take a, a random matrix and I take its trace, okay, some of a lot of things should be normal. If I square it, what's on the diagonal has not much to do with what was on the diagonal before. And if I cube it, that's true again, right? And so intuitively, it should be true very generally. But uh, I don't know that people have looked so carefully uh, Estelle Basor has done beautiful work analogous to this on some of the, uh, the non-compact ensembles, but Estelle has many, many talents, but interest in probability is not one of them, I'll just put it that way. And so I think nobody's looked, but it's probably out there ready to be brought <laughs> into focus. So I, I, I believe it's probably true, unless there's some accident that, that, that forces dependence, but, uh, but I don't... I don't I don't know it as a theorem. Is it dependence for the Chebyshev polynomials? Uh-huh. Which are the equivalent of the monomials on the circle, so that's... So uh, 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 we just heard from our last speaker that the independence of the... Uh, there is independence, but it's of the, of the Chebyshev polynomials. And uh, um, so, but good. They are... Things are independent, as they should be. I mean, it would be very surprising if they weren't. Uh, any other questions? Yep. Um, so you were saying before how if you get a unitary matrix and take it to some power bigger than what we just mentioned, you get exactly I mean, what? That, I'd just like to say for starters, is extremely surprising. I was just sort of not, the last part of that, I'm sorry, I couldn't pay attention because I just couldn't stop thinking about that. Good. <laughs> No, so, so the question is, um, uh, I'll paraphrase, hey, that was an amazing result about the high powers of the matrix being IID uniform. That's a paraphrase of the first part. Is it true for other groups? And um, it's exactly true for any of the compact Lie groups up to the four symmetries. For example, in the orthogonal group, the eigenvalues come in pairs. And so, you know, raising to a high power, you know, they come in conjugate pairs. So raising to a high power won't change that. Um, but up to that, it's true. So it's true for all the compact Lie groups. They're, they're, uh, if you take a, 
and not, not sufficiently high, you know, higher than the rank. Uh, they're exactly uniform on the uh, torus, on the right torus. So it, it's a, it is an algebraic fact. And it's not hard. Um, I remember when Eric told me about it, uh, it, it's, it, it's, if you, you know, it, there's this formula for Haar measure, I don't know, long gone now, but uh, it, this formula with the van der Monde determinant, and if you, um, if you take high powers of the traces, it's just the fact that the complex exponentials are, in the, are, are, are independent of each other as, as long as the coefficients are, are different. So in the van der Monde determinants, you know, it's e to the, you know, e to the i theta j and the highest power of, when you expand that out, the highest power you could get in the trigonometric polynomial if you expand out the van der Monde is e to the n theta j. If you integrate that against e to the something bigger than n theta j, you get zero, you know, because that's, that's it. But I mean, still, it's, I was shocked.